Hey, this is Damien Blankensop with The Quantified Body. This is a show where we look at cutting edge tools and tactics to improve our body's health, performance, and longevity. And we do this with a quantified perspective, always looking for data such as biomarkers for real evidence to back up what we're doing. We try to avoid the trap of following anecdotal opinion, that's the goal, and just hoping for results. But we also don't want to wait for science to prove these tools without a doubt via gold standard double blind studies, because it really takes so long for that to actually happen. Instead, we try to find a middle ground on this show, looking for biomarkers and data that you can use to track and give you more confidence in the results of what you're doing. We have guests that range from academic researchers and experts in the biomarkers, the tools and the tactics, to real live experimenters who have done their own biohacking experiments and tracked biomarkers to show their results. Today we're looking at detoxification again. This is one of my favorite subjects because I just feel like it's a simple lever which can give benefits to you no matter who you are. If you're suffering from health issues or if you're an athlete or a busy exec trying to inch up your performance, detoxification can make a difference to you. We've already done deep dives on mercury and lead with Dr. Chris Shade and Dr. Gary Gordon. Today we're going to look more broadly at other heavy metal toxins and chemical toxins which are all around us in everyday life in the modern world. We're going to look at the different testing methods and some case studies of what kinds of impacts toxins can have on you. Today's guest is Cara Fitzgerald. Dr. Fitzgerald received her doctorate of naturopathic medicine from National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. She is the lead author and editor of Case Studies in Integrative and Functional Medicine, a contributing author to Laboratory Evaluations for Integrative and Functional Medicine, and the Institute for Functional Medicine's updated textbook for functional medicine. That's a bit of a mouthful, but you get the idea. She's into laboratory testing and she's into integrative and functional medicine and she's got a lot of experience to back it up. She's also on the faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine. She previously held a position in nutritional biochemistry and laboratory science at Metametrics. So you'll have heard them come up a little bit as a company. They're now Genova since a merger, but they're one of the big clinical testing laboratories out there that you can use for testing. So she worked there previously, and now she has her own clinic in Connecticut. So today's episode is going to give you a really broad background and depth of knowledge into some of the testing and approaches we can take to detoxify our bodies better. To get the show notes where we break out the biomarkers, the tests, the tools and the tactics so that you've really got a really quick way to understand everything from today's show, go to thequantifiedbody.net forward slash episodes and pick the episode out now. You really do get a lot of information from the website. We break everything out and we explain it clearly because we understand that these shows can at times get a bit technical for some of you out there. So we do our best to put the information in a very short form format on the blog, very useful for you if you haven't already checked it out there. Um, if you want to get the same information in your email inbox every time an episode comes out, you can go to thequantifiedbody.net forward slash newsletter, pop your email in there, and you'll get it straight to your inbox. The Quantified Body. New technologies are bringing us more and better data on our bodies every day. This data promises to help us make better decisions for better health, higher performance, less disease, and greater longevity. In the Quantified Body, we explore this promise to find out where it is creating real world results, improving bodies, and improving lives. Kara, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And I've just enjoyed talking to you for the last 10 minutes about all things toxicity. So I look forward to jumping in and uh, talking to your audience. Absolutely. So yeah, I don't know if it's a passion of yours. It's been a little bit of a passion of mine, toxins and everything. And so I heard you on the Detox Summit and it was a great interview you did there. It was one of the better ones uh, on toxicity. So that's why I reached out with you. I thought it um, would be great to have a discussion with you about it. So how did you first connect with the topic of toxicity? Where did it come around for you? Is it something you came across in your practice a lot or how did that whole interest start for you? Yeah, that's a good question, Damien. I did my postdoctorate training at Metametrics Clinical Lab in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Metametrics was later, oh, not too long ago, it was purchased by Genova. So if you're familiar with Genova, they're running a Metametrics suite of testing. And Metametrics, it was studying the toxins 
from a laboratory perspective and also being part of the medical education team. So not only lecturing, but speaking, doing consultations with doctors all of the time about the toxic burden. Incidentally, I was also in my clinical practice and have been all along, so using it in practice. But I came into the study of toxins from a postdoc in the lab. Great, great. So in your practice, is this something that you come across quite often? You're in integrative medicine. Actually, let's take a step back a little bit because we haven't really talked about integrative medicine before. We had Jeffrey Bland talking about what functional medicine is. So what is integrative medicine in comparison? Another really good question. It's always important to define terms. And I would imagine that you could ask 20 of us who say that we're integrative or functional and you'll get little variations of definitions. <laughs> so integrative is sort of an overarching definition that I think acknowledges the value in all forms of medicine. So I am trained as a naturopathic physician. We do indeed prescribe medication when it's indicated, but my fun, you know, my core training is in taking a natural approach, or as we used to say, removing the obstacles of cure, working on foundational wellness and health and healing and nutrients and so forth. And then if medications are indicated, you step in, or if surgery is indicated, you step in. So an integrative approach really quite simply is acknowledging the value and when to use all of these systems of medicine that we have. So a traditional or a conventional Western approach, a traditional naturopathic approach, you, know, you can pull in Ayurveda, you can pull in traditional Chinese medicine as you're trained and as it's indicated with a given patient. So that's integrative medicine. Now, within that is functional medicine. And um, for me, functional medicine is a way for us to practice systems medicine. And most functional medicine practitioners would say that they're integrative. So that's the larger picture. And then you drill down into particular approaches. And for me, functional medicine is a model of being able to practice systems medicine. So it's a way of data capturing, of analyzing the patient that enables us to step back. Actually, Dr. Bland, Jeff Bland has said from telescope to microscope. So you want to look at the being in their environment and then you want to drill down to the molecular level. And that's an incredibly careful and detailed history. And to actually be able to capture that, uh, you need a good structure. And so the Institute of Functional Medicine has the matrix. And this is a fabulous tool that you use in your chart note, the matrix for capturing systems medicine. And of course, actually, let me go over here and, and tack on to that what Jeff Bland said. I mean, so obviously you're looking at the being and function and you're correcting those imbalances. You're correcting the, the dysfunction, you know, to restore wellness. And So, I mean, basically you come from two schools, like the traditional medicine schools that we know in hospitals and so on. And you've also studied the functional medicine and, and some other naturopathic and alternative sides as well. And you, you just try to use whichever tool you think is relevant to the situation. And that sounds like the best of all worlds, right? Sounds like the best approach. And I'd say that's really the kind of the approach we like to get covered on here, where it's just taking whatever works and whatever context without any allegiance or whatever to any, um, there's a little bit of politics and, and fan stuff going on, as always does go on in, in health. But there's all these different modalities which fit different situations. So it sounds really like the best of all worlds. And in terms of um, toxicity, when you're addressing that, is it more on a functional medicine side or would you find it a bit of a mix of everything? Addressing toxicity. What do you mean from a functional perspective? Can you? I'm just, well, I'm just trying to understand how you approach the whole thing. Um, so, for instance, when a patient walks in into your practice and you typically decide that there's some element of toxicity involved in their problems, um, where would that come from? Would that come from one discipline or is it or is it like a bit from everywhere? Well, I would say that conventional medicine, the conventional Western model, doesn't acknowledge the influence of toxins in the disease process sufficiently yet. The data are completely irrefutable. So there's some movement towards that. So it would be as a functional medicine doctor. Baseline, anybody walking into my office has a toxic burden. That has been well established. So anyone coming into my practice I know has a toxic burden and that toxins are influencing the course of disease that they're presenting with. Most of the individuals who come to see me in my practice have something complex and chronic. So I know that toxins are playing a part of that. But the question becomes for me as the clinician and my analysis, my detailed analysis of the patient, both history and lab, is what extent 
are toxins influencing this person's disease process? And therefore, in terms of our treatment, how immediately and how aggressively are we going to address them? So always a toxic burden, always influencing the course of disease. We're always, and, and in fact, when you restore, when you take a, a functional sort of a systems approach to treating somebody and you take care of their diet and you make sure their nutrients are appropriate, I mean, those extremely fundamental steps are helping release the toxic burden. So toxins are always addressed in, in my practice. All of those foundational things are addressing the toxic load that we all have. But then the second piece becomes, once we go in there and do that foundational assessment and treatment, do we need to then chelate, move into a more aggressive detox protocol, you know, do further laboratory evaluations and so forth. For all of the folks who come to see me, incidentally, Damien, I do assess, as I talked about on the detox summit, everybody, I look at whole blood metals and it's a screening tool. So you do that test with everyone who comes into your practice? Yeah, I sure do. I'm always screening for stuff. And you know that whole bloods are reflective of current exposure. So going on in their life now, but it's a screening tool. And then we'll go on and do further assessment as I deem appropriate from taking a history. And so that's kind of your baseline. Okay, great. So you're saying basically this applies to people with chronic complex conditions, which you tend to treat. Would you say that there's other people who should think of this also? I'm thinking how far should it go? Like if someone's athletic performance isn't as good or if their mental performance isn't as good, or if they're just someone normal who's like a bit tired these days, but it's not, they haven't classified themselves as actually ill yet, or you know, they're not going to see doctors about it, but they just don't feel in top form and they're not doing so well in general. Are these the types of symptoms or are there specific symptoms that anyone who doesn't feel like they're in a chronic condition yet should look at as a pointer that this may be something they should look at? Yeah, absolutely. So let me underline it. Let me scream this from the rooftops. We all have a toxic burden, period. We all do. We've all been exposed to toxins. We'll have an influence in the course of our wellness. So we want to consider them. Now, in my practice, most of the individuals who see me happen to have complex chronic disease. That's just, you know, that's my training. That's who I work with. Right, right. So those individuals absolutely have a toxic burden. We all do. And there are steps that we all need to take to ensure that we minimize our toxic exposures, uh, as well as our body's ability to detox. And so I would say an emphatic yes to optimize athletic performance. You absolutely want to consider the toxic burden or to a little bit of brain fog. So going back to your question to me, what are some typical signs and symptoms you might see? Certainly fatigue. Actually, fatigue would be a piece of the puzzle. Brain fog is a pretty classic first type of sign. Allergic disease. When you look at the literature on the impact of toxins, you'll see allergies screaming. So a lot of the organotoxins, BPA, phthalates, parabens, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those, the first reaction is some sort of an allergic reaction. And that's because the body wants it out. You know, you're exposed to something toxic, you sneeze or you develop a rash. I mean, it's this reactive response to some bad thing trying to come in. So like you're saying, would that be like rashes? Would, would that be some kind of tiredness responses to foods? Or could it also be like sneezing, like hay fever kind of things? Yes, 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 and yes, and yes. They're broad, and generally speaking, they're nonspecific. Endocrine disruption is another potential reaction. So hypothyroidism, hormonal irregularities, estrogen dominance, and so forth, all of these things can be influenced by toxins. Really, almost any symptom can have a toxic burden. And this is because when you drill down to the molecular level, when you look at what toxins are actually doing in the body at the molecular level, one of the fundamental lesions is increased oxidative stress. I mean, they're causing that fundamental imbalance in the mitochondria, in tissue, in um, towards different tissue. You know, they're just doing this very fundamental damage process. But depending on the type of toxin, you can get some idea of symptoms but they're still they're still broad damien i, I hope that i'm making sense but well, yeah, i know it's i mean it's still an area we're investigating and exploring one of the ways i look at it is like these are basically molecules the only reason they're toxins is because they're unnatural to our body right our body's made up of certain types of molecules and atoms and these come into the body and just because of the way chemistry is biochemistry is they connect with they disrupt 
And they change in some cases how things are working in our body because instead of selenium, we have some other toxin which is binding to something in our body which it shouldn't be. So it's kind of like distorting how our bodies are supposed to work and therefore you know they start to work in different ways which means we get some kind of symptoms we're not used to which you've referred to many is that a fair way to explain it i think that yeah that absolutely that's nice that's a really nice snapshot that's easily digestible yes you know what's interesting just leaping off of that is the idea of polychlorinated biphenols or pcbs so talking about an unnatural compound something that the body doesn't recognize oftentimes we store these compounds in our fat. You know, we want to get them out. And PCBs, certain metals and so forth, we're, the body is smart enough to say, I don't know what this does. I'm getting it out of here. The safest place to dump it is in the fat. And so you'll see it accumulate there. And the half-life, the time these toxins can stay around in the body, it moves into the decades and decades because our body isn't equipped. We didn't evolve with these exposures because they are synthetic, as you said. They're man-made. So we sequester them and they stick around, which is which is a drag, which is unfortunate, which is why we would like to minimize our exposure. That's great. I'd just be interested, have you tested yourself? Have you run these like whole blood, for instance, uh, screens on yourself or other people which are more normal and they don't have, haven't come into your practice as a chronic disease level? And in comparison, how do they compare to the chronically ill toxin levels lower? Or how does it look in your profile versus someone else's? That's a great question. So it depends on what we're looking at. So for instance, if you have a water-soluble toxin that our body can get rid of, you might see periodic high levels in an individual. Say that you just purchased a carpet, and that carpet is off-gassing petroleum derivative molecules that your body can eliminate. So you might measure some of those compounds and you'll see a lot of them in your urine. And then you step away from the carpet, you know, your body turns it over pretty quickly if you have good detoxification systems and you'll see them normalize. So you could see that in a healthy individual. And, you know, one of the signs is that we all have these toxic burdens and in a healthy individual, they're able to detox and remove and get on with their life. They might notice when they're in the in the carpet off-gassing room, they've got a little bit of a runny nose or maybe a slight headache or a cough, some of the signs. But then they get out, they deal, you know, life goes on and they're no longer bothered. So in the toxic person, yeah, you could absolutely see higher levels in the person with a complex chronic condition. And part of this is that their body isn't able to get rid of them so well. They just might have detoxing difficulties, be it phase one, the first step in detox, or phase two. And for myriad reasons, we can have challenge. Maybe we don't have adequate nutrients to detox. You know, glutathione, I'm sure you've talked to your folks about it before, is really one of the major players in our ability to detox. But we actually waste it. I shouldn't say waste it. We, we don't recycle glutathione when we use it to detox. So in that complex chronic disease patient with a large accumulation of toxins, they may have spent their glutathione and they have not adequately replenished it yet. Glutathione comes from three different amino acids in the body. Uh, that's how we're able to make it. But if you're chronically detoxing or attempting to detox, you could run out of glutathione. Like one mole of glutathione detoxes one mole of toxin, be it mercury or be it... Um, any number of different organic toxins. We also can have mutations in our ability to detox. You know, we can have genetic mutations that might slow us down and make us vulnerable to accumulation of certain toxins. And we see that in complex chronic patients as well. So in those cases, we may choose to look at those genetic mutations. And when we find them, we really want to support those particular areas um, all the more aggressively. So a lot of people have mutations in the glutathione S transferase enzymes, and those are the glutathione S transferase enzymes are, as you can imagine, as the name implies, they're major players in our ability to detox across the body, not just in the liver, but in the skin and in the kidneys and in the gut and in the brain. And we can have mutation in these, in these enzymes, and therefore, when we see it in our patients, uh, and when we know they have a toxic burden, we need to get in there and really support it. Yeah, so you've outlined many different ways in which our detox system may not be able to cope with the flood of toxins we're getting these days from many different synthetic sources, carpets and, and heavy metals and so on. 
So is this something, I guess something I just want the audience to understand is our mutations, right? Our issues with your detox system, pretty rare. When we talk about mutations, sometimes genetic mutations, it sounds like it could be something rare and it's like one in a hundred or one in a thousand. But my understanding is that a lot of these mutations today are relatively common. It's a bit like the MTHFR, which is extremely common these days. So there's a lot of these mutations and just differences in our makeup, which mean that maybe we're not, we haven't got a super powered detox system, which is really working really, really efficiently in terms of chemical processes. And it slows it down a bit. And then when you combine that with the fact that we have a lot of toxins around us today, it seems relatively common that it can crop up for some people that this is hampering them in some way. Yeah. Yep. You got it. Okay. So you asked me about the incidence of mutations in our detox system. Are they common? You asked me. Yeah, they sure are. We have somewhere on the order of 4 million single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these mutations that you and I are talking about, these single base pair switches like MTHFR is the most famous of those. We have somewhere in the order of 4 million. I mean, we have tons of them, loads of them. Many of those aren't significant. We have backup systems. There's a lot of redundancy built into the body. So we do have backup systems. So a lot of those aren't going to be particularly relevant to us and to disease process, but there are also many that are. So yeah, I would say that all of us likely have some mutations in our ability to detox. The question is, what hand of cards were we dealt? And how big of a deal is that playing in our disease process? And so I do look at detox uh, SNPs in a lot of my patients. It may not be the first thing I look at. It depends on what someone presents with, but I do end up looking at them frequently. So the glutathione S transfer system, it's huge. We have many of them uh, in different types and in different tissue locations. So when you see one, it's not the end of the world. Yes, We do want to support it, of course, but it's when you see multiple or when you see patterns. So MTHFR is a big player in detox as well. Indirectly, but significantly, it's going to help us make the glutathione that we need for the glutathione as transferases. I mean, it's a big, MTHFR is a fundamental player in methylation. And we detox with methylation also. So everything is interconnected and a nice broad snapshot of what are the genetic issues and how many and and then go back to whether or not you think it's playing a role in whatever the individual is presenting with. And there's a lot of angles we need to look at here to guide us in our treatments. But I want to step out for just a second so as not to overwhelm the listener. Really, the very first thing that we can do, Damien, the very first thing, and you know this, I know this and use this in my practice, is investigates what's going on in current time and remove exposure sources. So any patient coming into my practice will have a meeting with my nutritionist on clean living, clean eating, clean living in the home and so forth. So lowering the toxic burden is huge. Right. This sounds like your foundational work that you said you did first. So what are the biggest things that you do there that you feel are important to clear the way? Yeah. So far and away, the biggest thing we can do is clean up our diet and go as organic as much as possible. And I would argue we want to, I would say that most urgently, we want to look at clean fat sources. So organic butters, organic milks, organic meats, etc. It really almost as important would be looking at organic vegetables and fruits and so forth and going as organic as you possibly can using the dirty dozen from the environmental working group as our baseline, at least achieve the dirty dozen. And if you can't eat organic versions of those like apples and... So this dirty dozen are the ones with the highest levels of pesticides and are there other chemicals involved in those dirty dozen or is it primarily pesticides in their many forms because of neurotoxins and different ones? Primarily, we're looking at pesticides in their many forms. We could move into discussing That's what the environmental working group is testing anyway. They're looking at pesticides. We could then talk about metals. We could talk about genetic modification, but that would that would bring us into tomorrow. We would be talking. Yeah, exactly. about but if we go organic, Damien, if we go organic as much as possible, we're going to bypass all of these toxin issues to the best of our ability. So that's the foundational, that's the entry point. And I guess because some people are concerned about cost of organics. So I'm guessing that's where you introduced the concept of the dirty dozen, trying to focus on the biggest ones. Yes, exactly. Focus on the major players. Do not eat non-organic apples. If you can't find good organic apples, then just skip apples. Secondarily, say you're in a location where you simply cannot find organics at all. I remember in medical school having a debate with my roommate at the time. Kara, there are no organics. She lived in Hawaii. <laughs> I can't find it hard to believe there are no organics in Hawaii. There are no organics in Hawaii, she argued with me. This was years ago. 
I, I don't know that I buy it. But then you talk about, okay, how do you clean the food? How do you clean it appropriately? You can do, you can use a vinegar solution. You can soak your fruits and vegetables in there and you can reduce the pesticide load that way. But it's not optimal, but it's a whole lot better than not doing anything else. So a 10% white vinegar solution, that is the cheapest vinegar off the shelf at, at the grocery store, 10% in a basin of water and soak the vegetables for three to five minutes. That's going to reduce the water-soluble pesticides. Now, I use the vinegar wash. I Actually, I use it all the time for any fruit or vegetable that I'm washing because it's easy. I just have a spray bottle at my sink. I actually just use 100% vinegar. It's so cheap. I have a bottle of vinegar, and I just twist on a sprayer, and I just spritz it on whatever I need to wash and let it soak for a period of time. So... That would be the next best thing. Great, great. I've traveled in many countries and I've kind of tried to practice eating clean and it can be pretty challenging to find organics in some countries, especially third world countries. And so I've used a similar strategy as you're outlining, focusing on the ones that are cleaner, avoiding the worst ones and trying to clean. So, you know, thank you for that very practical tip. That's very helpful for people. So once you've done this first... Let me just throw in one more tip here. And I'm sure you were doing this when you were traveling. You can always bring some extra vitamin C. We were talking about how much we love that at the <laughs> beginning. You can bring some extra nutrients nutrients to just protect yourself. Right, absolutely. And I'm sure you get in, we can talk about that in the kind of treatments you use, which are also helping from that level. So is this the one big part of your foundational area? Or is there something else you advise your clients to do? I mean, water or something in the house or anything like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other major things that, you know, guidelines to clean living. Yes, you absolutely want to filter your water appropriately. I think Charcoal filtration is the absolute way to go. I don't know what your position is on reverse osmosis, but we can get into big problems if you remove all the minerals from your water. So reverse osmosis is the cleanest. There's no question about it, but all the minerals are gone. And you can develop significant, ironically, dehydration from consuming lots of reverse osmosis if you don't adequately replenish the minerals. So for me, I use and I recommend charcoal filtration to my patients. Have you got a, any specific brands? Just to make this a little bit of practical in terms of recommendation, if someone wanted to go and get something to help them. Yes. So my favorite brand has been for years, the Multipure uh -huh. filtration system. And you can get that. I think it's multipure.com. It's easy to, to get. It's pretty pricey, though. Um, they have a bunch of different systems, so there's different price points on it. But the other one that it's nice and it has a much more palatable price point is from is Yusana. I think both of those are quality products. Great. I've been using Berkey. I don't know if you've come across them before. I haven't. I haven't. But you can send me some info. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just a different alternative I, I've seen. I'm, I'm not sure how they compare to yours. So, yeah. So you go through, you do a whole home assessment with the patient and do the, just minimize exposure sources in the home. Incidentally, actually, I have a blog. I have a couple blogs on lead. I have a blog at drcarafitzgerald.com, drcarafitzgerald.com on lead exposure. And it was a case of Parkinson disease. This woman was rehabbing a, a lead house. She was, lead paint was in this old house they were rehabbing and she ended up getting very, very early onset Parkinson disease and concurrently gave birth to a child who was later diagnosed with autism. I think both of those were significantly, significantly, significantly influenced by this lead exposure. There are some pretty nifty tools if you're concerned about lead with your patients, and I often am. You know, if I do a urine or, or, or a blood test, there's some pretty nifty kits that you can do home lead testing with, and you can buy these on Amazon, and uh, you can get them at Home Depot or whatever those big hardware stores are in the UK. You can buy lead swab kits and and just swap stuff. A lot of you know, so a lot of ceramics that come in from China and thereabouts can have lead in the ceramic. And so you swab this particular lead sticks that I use, uh, and and it'll change color if lead is present. And so if you look on that blog, you'll see if you scroll down, you'll see a a patient sent in a photo of the positive finding on one of the plates that she eats on every day. And she's got, she always had high lead and we needed to do some sleuthing to identify it. And it was the ceramic. Wow. Is this potentially a lot of ceramics? Everything comes from China these days. And having lived in China, I could definitely understand that lead might be in everything. Is lead particles around it or is this actually, they've used it in the material itself? They've used it in the material. 
Mm -hmm. So it's in the ceramic. Yeah. And it's absolutely worth it then. It would be great for you to do this yourself, Damien, and see what you find. Sounds like an amazing test. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, and it's handy and it's cheap. There are more sophisticated and sensitive tests that some of us use clinically, but this is an easy, easy, cheap way to just get in there and start looking. Now, when we did it, when I first started using these at the laboratory, we swabbed all of our teacups and, and teapots and plates that we had in the lab. We all had different plates in our offices that we ate from. And Eve Brawley, uh, the daughter of the former owners of Metametrics, had this beautiful teapot she brought home from China. And it was riddled with lead. It was absolutely riddled with lead. Yes. You know, this is really important because often if we go back to like you said, one of the screens that you do is the whole blood. The first screen you do is a whole blood test for heavy metals and, and metals. It'd be interesting which metals they are. And then you have to kind of go through this detective process like you've been going through. It's like, where is this coming from? Because when you have high levels of lead or arsenic and you can't, it doesn't make sense sometimes. Where is this coming from? I don't know what exposure it might be. Yes. So first of all, what is that test? Which metals are you screening for in that test? In my whole blood, it, and these are all routinely covered by insurance in the States, so it's extremely easy for me to do. I look at mercury, lead, cadmium, and arsenic in everybody. Another great example, a mother and a daughter came to me. Actually, daughter was complaining. Her chief complaint was anxiety. She was in her 20s, and it was so disabling, early 20s. She was unable to attend college. She had to withdraw from college because of this relatively recent onset of de severely debilitating anxiety. In her history, she did mention, actually, her mom was with her, and they both were putting massive amounts of effort into eating very healthy. They were buying organic. They were eating lots of fish. I mean, they were proud of themselves, and clearly they were doing a good job. But one of the things that they had on a routine basis, multiple times per week, was sea bass. And you and I know sea bass is very high in mercury. When I got her blood mercury, her whole blood mercury, it was off the charts. I mean, that was the smoking gun in this girl's anxiety. She was becoming mad as a hatter. She was in frank, acute mercury toxicity from chronic ingestion of sea bass, of mercury toxic sea bass. And so we removed the exposure source and we detox her and her symptoms abated considerably. And she was able to return to school. And she does need ongoing treatment and we need to pay attention to what's going on with her regard to detoxing. But it was quite useful in that regard. Sometimes, you know, I'm kind of topic jumping here a little bit, Damien, you can reel me back in. But sometimes you'll see, and in fact, frequently, we won't see any evidence of toxins in the blood. And that's because the half-life, so the amount of time these toxins actually spend in the blood isn't long at all. It's hours or a day or two. They're so toxic. These metals are so toxic to us that our body wants to clear them out, wants to take them out of circulation as soon as possible. For lead, we store it in the bone. Mercury is going in the fat, etc. So you will get a lot of people who have no burden at all. So for those individuals, we need to drill down a little bit more deep when I suspect a metals burden, which I really do for most folks. At some point after we've addressed the foundational, we're going to do what we call a chelation challenge. We're going to look at the urine level of toxic metals, and I'll give them a compound that will help draw the chemical, the metals from the body and dump them into the urine. And then I get an assessment of total body burden. Great. So that's versus the whole blood, which we were saying, it's very much ongoing exposure. I guess when you're doing that, it's interesting because it's kind of the critical. It's like, what are you being exposed to kind of every day is more likely to show up there. That's why it makes a lot of sense if you do that first, because it could be something that's going on every single day and it make any worse. Versus looking at this urine challenge test, which allows you to see what's the history, like and how much have they have gotten this burden. So when you're doing this, you, we have spoken a little bit about the urine challenge test before. Which uh, labs do you use? What kind of uh, cheat chelator are you using for provoking challenge? I think that Metametrics does a great job, you know, just being really familiar with their analytics. And so this would be going through Genova. I think they do a great job. I also think Doctors Data does a really good job. Those are the major those are the two labs that I use for this. Great. Just out of interest, can you compare the two or basically are they on different standards? So you have to stick with one. So if you've got your history with different patients with metametrics, it makes sense for you to stick with that because then you've got yes. this comparison. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's absolutely right. I mean, you can take a high, generally speaking, if you see a high in doctor's data, you're going to see a high in, in any assay or you're going to see it in metametrics. But you're right. There's different units. There's different methodology. So it's wise to just continue with whatever lab you did your baseline assessment, it's wise to continue your follow-up assessments with that lab. Just keep doing the same test. 
So for chelation, remember, going back to the foundation, we need to make sure that individual can detox. So we need to make sure their nutrients are up to speed, you know, that phase one and phase two is good. We need to absolutely make sure kidney function is ideal, that they're moving their bowels, they're having at least one complete BM per day. So once we have all of that dialed in, then we go in and we do a chelation challenge. For most of my patients, I'm going to use an oral DMSA challenge. And generally speaking, the easiest way to go is thousand milligrams in two divided doses over eight hours. So the half-life of DMSA, some people will choose to do a 24-hour toxic metal measurement, but I think eight hours is plenty because the half-life of DMSA is just under that. So the DMSA is going to be cleared out of the body quickly, and that's what you're trying to look at. You're want, you want to see what the DMSA, what metals it's pulling out. So for that reason, you can do an eight-hour measurement. You start the collection, take 500 milligrams or thereabouts of DMSA, and then four hours into the collection, you take 500 milligrams or thereabouts, the second dose of DMSA, and then you collect for another four hours, and then you take a portion, you mix the urine, take a portion of that specimen and send it into the lab. And I think that's a decent way to assess some of my individuals who are too sensitive, for whom I think the DMSA is not going to be tolerated well, we can use N-acetylcysteine, glycine. There's a number of natural compounds that we can use. There are data on N-acetylcysteine as an effective alpha lipoic acid having chelative properties will help pull it out. So we can do that if I deem it necessary. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing up the, uh, you were talking about the importance of doing your nutrient stage first. It's all, it's safety because if you're going to use a chelator and draw toxins out, um, heavy metals, then it can be a bit hard on the kidneys and the other detox organs. And incidentally, if you start drawing it out and they don't have adequate nutrients, if their detox systems aren't up and running and they're very dependent on nutrients, selenium and zinc and glutathione and methyl donors and many amino acids, I mean, if those aren't there ready to do their job, you will make the person thicker. So even basic kidney function has to be intact. And beyond that, they need to have their detox ability really up and running. The other thing is, Damien, this is so fundamental. It's so fundamental. And that is one of the major routes of entry into the body is orally. So we eat toxins. We're eating these metals in our food or whatever. And if you're deficient in minerals, if you're deficient in your essential minerals, those transport proteins, the ways that their minerals are taken into the body, if there are no minerals or low minerals present, those transport proteins will be hijacked by toxins. And this data has been demonstrated. So one of the easiest ways you can reduce your exposure source of metals is making sure you have adequate essential minerals in your body. Like it's so foundational because those transport, I mean, this has been shown actually very strongly in iron deficient anemia, cadmium, manganese, which can be toxic in high amounts, mercury and so forth. They can, they hitch a ride into those transport proteins that would otherwise be used for iron or magnesium. Actually, they're relatively nonspecific. So a lot of essential minerals move into the body using these transport proteins. And if you're deficient in your minerals, which most of us are eating a standard Western diet, those metals get a ride in. And the other huge piece of this is that these same transport proteins are at the blood-brain barrier. So not only are they entering into circulation through the gut, they're going to have readier or easier access to the brain and the central nervous system. So one of the most fundamental things is to make sure you have adequate nutrients and especially adequate essential minerals. Isn't that, it's profound. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So that's part of your foundation, right? Part of my very fundamental foundational. And amazingly simple. And so which nutrients do you focus on? Well, I focus on all of them, but I'm looking at, as you mentioned earlier, selenium. Selenium can actually bind and render inert mercury, bind it and pull it out of circulation in the body. So mercury is highly toxic and selenium can bind it and just allow us to eliminate it. It's potent. So if you've got a mercury burden, chances are you're burning through your selenium. Selenium is used elsewhere in the body as well. So selenium is a big player. All of them are. Magnesium is a huge, huge player. Zinc is a huge player. I would say that those are the biggest three. And then you also want to, of course, make sure you have adequate calcium. So lead is stored in bone. It's going to displace calcium and other nutrients. So you want to have adequate calcium in your diet or take some degree of a supplement. Chromium can be useful, secondarily vanadium, but really the major minerals, magnesium, selenium, 
zinc and so forth are what we want to have in abundant supply. How do you bring those levels up? I guess because I've come across this before that the way I thought about it was that it's kind of like because you've got these deficiencies, you've got these molecules with holes and it's just waiting to pick up something. So you're leaving all of these holes in your body, basically waiting to pick up something which is a similar molecule and you have the toxic molecule come along and that's, you were talking about the bones and calcium and lead seems to basically a similar molecule. It'll just bind there because you've left a, a gap open by having that deficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I mean, I think it's really great how straightforward it is really. And you, it's you can, elegant. yeah, it's, it's elegant the way it works. <laughs> you just eat a great diet and then supplement with extra minerals as see fit. So I assess mineral status in my patients. I'll look at red blood cell status of minerals and along with my whole blood toxins. And incidentally, Damien, on most of my patients, you'll see, generally speaking, higher amounts of toxins relative to their essential minerals. Like it's all of the time I see this. So there's, the toxins are a little bit higher, even if they're not frankly elevated, they're higher normal or something like that. And minerals are so often in all of us, you know, low or very low normal, it's just, or very low, low normal to very low. So you always see this skewed ratio or almost all the time I see this, unless somebody's really intentionally addressing it. And it's like, this is the most fundamental thing that we can turn around. We'll get your essential minerals nice and robust, and that alone will help drive down your toxins. But then we'll do all of the other things, look for exposures and so forth. I guess for the essential minerals, I don't, I don't know if you're going to bring this up, but the thing I've used in the past is the greens powders because they have a broad spectrum of nutrients other than just trying to eat a better diet with a greater variety of vegetables is really where, kind of where you got to start with this. But what are your main recommendations or the ways you try to get your patients up to speed with Well, that? okay, so since I'm testing, I'm going to see the degree of the deficiency. And if it is is high enough, I'm going to supplement them with individual nutrients. So I very often use magnesium as a standalone nutrient. I very often use zinc as a standalone nutrient. Selenium, since we don't need as much, or molybdenum or some of the others, we can use in a complex mineral supplement. I think the greens powder is great. Whatever company you're using, obviously, you know that they're ensuring their quality and they've tested for metal quantities and so on and so forth. So it's a super clean product. It's rich in metal. So that's a nice thing. So baseline. So while, while I'm first starting to work with an individual and they're really depleted, I'm probably going to use individual supplements, relatively high doses to get them up to good levels. And then after that, we can do a complex mineral formula. And obviously we're working with their diet. So for a period of time, we're using individual nutrients. Great, great. That's the importance of, even if someone's not chronically ill, would you recommend they go to a practitioner such as yourself if they feel this could be an issue for them? If it is athletic performance or whatever it is, yes. it's still worthwhile going through this process yes. um, with a practitioner to get it done right, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, and it's really a lot of fun. So when I was in the lab, <laughs> it is. And right. So it's very interesting to look at your biochemistry. I mean, it's a lot of fun when you get energy and yes. performance back and you start thinking clearer. All these things are really exciting. Well, now not only that, Damien, but think about disease prevention. And you know, now we're moving into the world of epigenetics, which I'm sure you've talked to your people about. So not only are you preventing disease in yourself, but if you are going on to have children, you're preventing disease in them and their offspring and on and on and on. If you think about epigenetics, I mean, it's amazing what wellness will do to us, not only us as an individual, but really globally shifting the planet and the generations to come. It's so incredible. But I would say that it's a continuum of wellness. So optimizing athletic performance is not that different from treating the complex chronic disease. You're still seeing underlying nutrient deficiencies. You might be seeing in the athlete increased oxidative stress. In fact, that's common because they've got tons of mitochondria that are incredibly active. So you're going to be seeing some of those same imbalances. I used to, when I was in medical school, I was a road racer and I did a lot of, in fact, I liked criterium. So I was working really hard at building up tons of mitochondria in my legs and my quads and stuff. And I enjoyed doing that at the lab. We had a lot of physicians focusing on wellness in the lab and looking at data of athletes is so interesting and cool. And working on optimizing mitochondrial status, making sure their nutrients are extremely dialed in so that you can shave a second or a few seconds off their time. And after your season, oftentimes athletes notoriously get sick as soon as they finish the intense period of training and then all of their event schedule, they often get sick. So how do you prevent that as well? And that's something that we could do. So sure, 
I'm more than happy to work on wellness. I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> Would you say the patients which get chronically ill stick with it and work with wellness afterwards? I'm just interested from a the standpoint, once they've learned about somebody's tools, basically they see the benefits themselves for just their daily life and being proactive. Yes, it's like throwing the stone in the pond. There's this remarkable ripple effect. And then their friends and their family say, oh my gosh, look at you. You look so much better. You have so much energy. Your skin is gorgeous. You've lost all this weight. What did you do? And so they have this influence on those around them just by being representatives of what wellness can be. I love to point out, you said the way wellness can be, because I do feel that a lot of us are walking around and we feel like we're normal today. But if we went through these kinds of processes, we'd feel this level of being well, which we haven't actually felt before. And certainly the way I've felt on my journey, I feel like I'm thinking clearer than I ever have and, and things like this. So, you know, I think that it's a real shame that I guess we don't realize that we could be better and we could feel better because we've accepted some kind of norm, maybe because it's been going on so long. That's right. We all acclimatize to whatever is in front of us. I mean, there's that analogy where the frog, if you put a frog in a pot of water, you can slowly turn the heat up until it's dead, until you boil it. And it will never, it <laughs> won't hop out. Like in a climate, we get used to the disease process. We get used to feeling lousy, just like the frog in the water. That's actually an analogy I learned from a patient who incidentally just became so wildly healthy. <laughs> he just really changed his experience. And he was writing to me and he said, it's like the frog in the pot analogy. The other thing is this whole idea that we lean on that we're aging. Oh, I'm 40 now, I'm supposed to be tired. Or I'm 45 now, my bones are supposed to ache. My skin is supposed to look all saggy and gray. I mean, there's this whole notion that we've built into the culture, I mean, into the medical system, because really the larger conventional medical model hasn't had, does not have still good tools around wellness. And so therefore, all of these various signs and symptoms that we've been talking about that are the early disease processes that we can change. I mean, they're just, they're so, they're always attributed to aging. Yeah, which is a real shame. It's a real shame. It's this scapegoat. We had Aubrey de Grey on the podcast previously. And he talks about how a lot of these are damaging processes, basically, that are going on. It's not aging. Yeah. I mean, we, we've given the name to all of this stuff, aging. Yes. But it seems like we're aging faster because of today's environment and the things that are going on today. And it's a shame that we just said, oh, it's aging, it's normal, instead of trying to like seize the day. So I just wanted to go back to a couple of things that we missed on urine tests. You said you're using different chelators in some patients, right? Because if they're sensitive to the DMSA, which I'm guessing is because maybe they're more mineral deficiencies or their detox system is having a harder time. Does it matter which chelator you're using in terms of what shows up in the tests? Are they standardized for DMSA or like so? And for instance, would N-acetylcysteine which you said is a bit softer, would that only chelate some of the metals? So, you know, you would get a footprint or a pattern just for some of the metals and not some of the others. Well, DMSA, so there are these bind, what they call binding affinities and binding affinities vary depending on the agent that you use. So, and binding affinity simply means how tightly does that chelating compound bind the metals you want to look at. And you can look up tables of binding affinity and see what's going to hang on to the metals you want to look at most avidly or with the highest affinity. So DMSA is really great and very well known for its ability to bind mercury, less so lead and less so some of the other metals, but it will bind them. It just doesn't have as high of a binding affinity. So N-acetylcysteine is actually a, a little bit less. Now it's not going to bind as tightly as DMSA because DMSA has structurally, if you look at it, it's got a lot of sites for the metals to bind on, a lot of these sulfur groups that the metals will bind on. So that if you look at it structurally, you can see why it's so good at pulling out metals. N-acetylcysteine is different. It's just structurally, it's got a, only a single sulfur group instead of, I think, four on DMSA. But it's still going to, N-acetylcysteine is just used in our body. We evolved using N-acetylcysteine and glutathione, which is made from N-acetylcysteine, to bind many different types of metals. So N-acetylcysteine is good. It's just not going to have the same kind of affinity. It's not going to bind them as strongly as a chemical. Now, DMSA is great for mercury. EDTA is going to be better for lead. I mean, it, depending on what you do clinically, there are different cocktails or compounds that you can use. I don't use EDTA in my practice because I don't do IV. And really, ideally, if you're going to use EDTA, you need to deliver it IV intravenously in order to really have it work. 
people use oral EDTA sometimes, but uh, the data around using oral EDTA isn't as good, whereas the data on DMSA is very strong and it's been used forever. Well, that's good to know. And I'm guessing that the labs, because they ask you to write down which chelator you use, they standardize against the different chelators? Well, no, generally it's so challenging in the lab because They'll have labs, lab ranges for if you used any kind of a chelating agent. Ranges based on chelating used versus no chelating used. Because if you try to get specific, like for DMSA or a specific ranges for EDTA, then you have to control how the protocol is administered. So everybody needs to use the same amount of DMSA and, and so forth. And there are some laboratories that focus exclusively on occupational exposures, so toxicity in the workplace or something like that. And some of those places will have a very tight protocol that you can follow, followed by ranges based on that. But it's a whole different arena. It's like when you just had a massive cadmium dump in a battery factory or something like that. But for most of us working with the less than occupational exposures, we're doing the best we can. Uh, it, that's what we have, chelated ranges versus non-chelated ranges. And it sounds like it's diagnostic enough for you to get your job done and identify the problems. Great. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. So we haven't really talked about the other side. We talked a lot about the metals and there's the whole chemical side, which we were talking about earlier with the pesticides. And how do you approach the chemical side of detecting that? And does that come after the metals? Like, so if you've gone through the whole blood metals and you thought there might be some more metals you went for the urine, when would the chemicals, when would you start looking at that and be suspicious that that might be an issue? Yeah, well, again, I'm going to assume that all of my patients have a burden and we really do. It's been <laughs> yeah. demonstrated. You can go to CDC and you'll see the people in the in Siberia, in the farthest reaches of the globe, have some sort of organotoxins, sadly. So we all have that. So I always come in with that and go through the clean living and get the nutrients and do all of those foundational things. And then from there, if what they're presenting to me with clinically and if their history is compelling, then we move into looking specifically at the organotoxins. And again, Genova Metametrics really developed awesome panels and you can get them now through Genova and you can look at the volatile organic solvents. You can look at PCBs. You can look at chlorinated pesticides. I mean, you can look at many different toxins, organotoxins. And I think that that can be incredibly useful. Great. So are those broad spectrum panels or do you have to kind of decide where you're going to focus? You can get a broad spectrum panel from them now that has a good price point on it. And I would go there. I would go there because unless somebody gives you a really clear exposure history, like for instance, my patient with ALS who grew up in an orange grove, or unless you can really nail down what likely they've been exposed to um, given their exposure history, it's doing a, starting with a broad pattern, a panel is, is the best way to go. And that's what I would, that's what I recommend and do. So, so what percentage of your patients are you looking at these kinds of panels with? Well, not as big as I do with the metals. I would say you know, maybe at this point, maybe 20% of my patients, I'm looking at these. And it's not that it isn't a very useful tool, because it okay. really is, especially when I've got neurodegenerative conditions presenting mm -hmm. to me where toxins are really, really thinking about toxins with those folks, like that early onset Parkinson disease. Now for her, she had this very obvious lead history, but for people coming out of Florida or they worked on a farm or so some of these odd neuro conditions really scream the need to have these kinds mm -hmm. of evaluations done. But you know, it's another point that I wanted to bring up, and this folds into our earlier discussion, and that is sometimes when you do these foundational interventions and you really get the body functioning, you're removing the toxins from the get-go. And sometimes the body does it. If the body's detoxability is, is intact, even in complex chronic disease, you can turn it around and people get on with their lives and naturally remove them. And you don't have to go towards the more aggressive evaluations and detox processes. Right. So it's, it's kind of like you're getting a lot of things just with your foundation work we were talking about earlier. You know, when you're saying you test for 20 percent of the patients, I guess these are the tricky patients where you kind of still sorting through it. And you're like, well, we haven't got it yet. So we're going to have to keep on looking for the sources. What are you kind of seeing comes up at these panels? Is it very, very different depending on where people come from, where they've lived, like you were talking about the specific examples there? Or do we all have a, a bit of these things in ours? And how do you treat it? Do you have to be very targeted? Like how do you get pesticides out of the body if, if it's not doing it itself? So from the exposure history, you're going to get a lot of information. It can give you an idea 
gosh, you know, a patient of mine who really had some of the worst allergies I've ever encountered. And remember, allergies are a potent clue that there's a toxic burden present, grew up literally with a super fun river flowing through his backyard phenomenally. But there were so many different toxins in this river. I mean, there were tanneries, leather tanneries around and just all sorts of stuff in Montana. So we needed to do a wide sweep. Incidentally, he had massive amounts of triclosan in his urine. Actually, it was by far the highest amount I've seen, which came from not this super fun site. We saw evidence of body burden of PCBs and other chemicals in him for sure. But the triclosan came from those hand sanitizers. I'm just thinking of it now because this guy is a physical therapist by training and he sanitizes his hand after every single solitary patient. And he was using it as a toothpaste. They throw tri triclosan in toothpaste. It's horrible. So he had off the charts levels just from using a hand sanitizer and a toothpaste. Just as an aside, folks, look and see if you've got triclosan around and if you do remove it, because not only is it will it increase allergies, all sorts of new data are emerging around it with regard to it being an endocrine disruptor, so messing with our hormones and so forth. So we can get triclosan out pretty readily. So anyway, Damien, organotoxins, I would recommend a broad sweep investigation to identify it unless there's a clear cut direction in their history. How would you target these things and, and remove them? A lot of these things you're talking about are fat soluble. Is that so correct? So let me give you a really neat story. When we were back in the lab, when we started to put together our toxins panels and we were really flooded in the research, I mean, so much data are coming out every hour of every day around, around diseases associated with toxin exposures. And you can imagine as we were developing these panels and we were in the research around them, we became really morose and very, very, very depressed. Like, what do you do? Everybody has PCBs and the half-life is, you know, decades and decades. And what do we do? And the, and the research around detoxification is not yet as strong. It will become because we have no choice but to face this. But we got pretty depressed in the lab just looking at these things day in and day out and day in, just really how up a creek we all were, how screwed we all were. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And so these PCBs that are in our bodies that we can't move out, the fact of the matter is, in fact, we do, we are able to move them somewhat. And one of the interesting stories was one of the guys in our lab had developed this farm raised salmon on a bagel habit. So every morning for breakfast, he would have a salmon, you know, locks on a bagel every single morning. And it's farm raised, tastes delicious, but man, is it loaded with PCBs. It really is. And so we were, all of us were experimenting on these panels ourselves because we were developing the assays. So tastes great. You know, he, I, he I gave his too. specimen and his PCBs were really off the chart. I mean, they were so elevated in him. And again, it's depressing knowing the half-life. Oh my God, he's stuck with these. But what we did with him was just put him on a good standard detox protocol. So a good detox powder, good greens drink, nice, super potent, high phytonutrient green drink, and, you know, a handful of various minerals and some brassica, you know, lots of those good brassica veggies and so forth, and measured a follow up. And we absolutely saw a reduction in his PCB burden. Great. How long afterwards was the follow up? It was a month. Wow. One month. Mm. Yeah. So he was moving it. And you know, the other thing, this is also sweating exercise, mobilizing fat will liberate PCBs into circulation. And that is if you're losing weight rapidly and you're not somehow doing a concurrent detox with that, that'll become a problem. And that's why some people can feel awful when they lose weight. But it's also an opportunity for us to detox. So in the weight loss process, you want to have care to make sure you're able to detox and that you're moving those toxins that you're going to liberate from fat into the blood, that you're moving them out. So there are ways that we can do this. And there is a small but emerging pool of research that suggests we can move these guys out. There's a group out of the University of Kentucky here who have shown in animal studies primarily that just this, combating the effects of PCBs, which are very oxidative, with essential fatty acids and with different phytonutrients, plant-based nutrients, will reduce the toxicity of the compounds. So not only can we help remove them for, from our bodies, but we also reduce the damage that they cause. So those two ways of approaching it is effective and it's powerful and it puts us back into the driver's seat. So we don't have to be victims of this inevitable toxic burden 
that we have. Right. That's a great point to finish with because we want to think that it's not a great story to say you can detect all these toxins in your body and there's nothing you can do about them. So thank you so much for giving us that point of hope, you know, that um, actually just that our bodies are naturally able to do this if we work on the foundations you were talking about earlier, providing what the body needs. So I just want to give you one last quick fire question that we give everyone, which is what data metrics do you track for your own body on a routine basis? Is there anything that you follow up with monthly or six monthly or once a year? that you like to keep an eye on for yourself? This is a whole nother topic and we'll have to schedule me again, but I love the nutrition physical exam. And so a really easy data metric, this is actually not lab, but in the winter, I tend to get a little bit of eczema and I can track both how clean my diet is, as well as how my nutrient status is, like my essential fatty acids. And in particular, I find gamma linolenic acid to be well. So some of the physical changes that I can see in the winter in myself give me a nice picture of what I need to be doing differently. But with regard to my own health, I like using annually that this battery of testing that I do on my patients. So you were talking to me about people coming to me for wellness, and you absolutely can do it. And, and I recommend it to my family as well as, you know, as well as doing it myself. Let's, let me look at all my nutrients. Let me look at my toxins. Let me see how my mitochondria are functioning. Let me look at my amino acids and so forth. And you can cast this wide net, take a look at it and correct it with dietary changes. And Great, Cara, thank you. Okay, so you're really enthusiastic about this and, you know, it's been a great conversation and thanks for bringing up so much uh, new information and advice for the audience. So thank you very much for your time. You are welcome, Damien, my pleasure. To get more of The Quantified Body, subscribe on iTunes or go to the website theQuantifiedBody.net. That's T-H-E-Q-U-A-N-T-I-F-I-E-D-B-O-D-Y dot N-E-T. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, we are at twitter.com slash quantifiedbody. And on Facebook, we are at facebook.com forward slash quantifiedbodypodcast. If you've got feedback or requests for the show, you can email them to me at damien at thequantifiedbody.net. That's D-A-M-I-E-N at thequantifiedbody.net. Thanks for joining the show this week. See you next time.